18 months ago, I traveled to war-torn Kyiv to interview Ukraine's President Zelensky and the First Lady Olena Zelenska. Their country was fighting a bitter war for its freedom. Against all odds, they protected their resolve and their relationship. These kind of situations, they can make or break a marriage. Is your marriage stronger, do you think? Marriage gets stronger with challenges. I want this challenge to make us more united. And after two years of war, First Lady Elena Zelenska returns to Uncensored. First Lady, it's lovely to see you again. Last time I saw you was just four months after the war began in 2022, and I came to Kyiv, interviewed you and, and your husband, the president. How has your life been since then? How, how are you? It's interesting because I felt like we met more recently, not so long ago. And now it seems like it just, um, was four months after the start of the war, large-scale invasion. But my feeling was that not so much time has passed. So from this feeling, I can understand that for us, time, time um, stopped in some way. In, in one way, things are happening very quickly. Things are happening things are changing, but at, at the same time we, f we feel that time is static. But I don't think that in my life something has changed significantly. We are still living in the same mood as in um, uh, four months after the start of the large-scale war. The thing about war is it's relentless. It never stops. It must be, apart from anything else, it must be exhausting. How do you keep your energy? Yes, it is. It's difficult. It's not um, a sprint, it's a marathon. You have to maintain your energy at a, at a level, at some level. And sometimes I compare this state, sometimes on a smartphone, when the battery is down, it's running out, and you have an opportunity to charge it somewhere to make sure that you stay online, you do it. And, and you don't have an opportunity to fully charge your battery. You can't distract, get, get distracted from the war. You can't forget even for an hour about the war, go, to, um, go on holiday for a week away from the war. You're constantly in this state and you cannot fully recharge. Uh, Ever. But this objective is to have enough energy, enough peace to continue living, continue to, uh, to carry on with life. It's a job. It's another job for us for, for all of these months and now, unfortunately, two years. You've come to London and you've had a very busy few days. You met the Queen, Queen Camilla, our new Queen. You were at the coronation, of course, for her and the king. Uh, how was your meeting with our queen? I'm very happy to confess that it is not the first time we meet, and every time our meetings are very nice. It was a great privilege to meet Her Majesty, Majesty with Her Majesty yesterday, and we passed our greetings to His Majesty as well, and our best wishes for his um, health uh, from the president of Ukraine and from the Ukrainian nation. We were moved by his address to the Ukrainian nation on the second anniversary of the large-scale invasion. 
we really feel the support from the royal family and through them also the, the support from the British nation. This is really an indicator of unity of the state and the public. And it was, uh, I also uh, had a very good meeting with my friend Akshata Muti, the wife of the Prime Minister. We always have very warm meetings. There's always something to talk about, and not only the things that unite us as First Ladies, such as mental health projects, etc. But we can also talk about our families, about our children. We can give each other small gifts. And that yesterday was another very nice, very warm meeting. And I have to say, once again, thank you to the British people that every step I make here, starting with the royal family um, and to all the people that I meet here, we feel your support. It's sincere, it's warm, and it's not just a declaration. It's a feeling uh, of sincere and powerful support, and it really inspires us. Every visit means uh, large numbers of meetings. It's all very complicated, but every time I come back from London, I feel inspired. Just as, uh, as if I had a holiday, as if I recharged my batteries. And so, once again, thank you. I was a very surprised, many, I had many surprises for, uh, over these three days. The King obviously, sadly, has cancer and the Queen is continuing to perform her duties. You're somebody who has had to continue getting out of bed and going to work for your country. Did you feel a, an affinity with her, that she's now doing the same with her husband, obviously uh, quite seriously ill? I think it would be difficult to compare our activities. But I guess I could compare a president is elected by the public. The wife, is not, the wife of the president is not elected. It's not an official position. You're not authorized. Uh, you don't have any competences or administrative competences. But there are expectations from the public, and you, you feel that, and you have to uh, rise to, the, to those uh, expectations. And in this sense, I guess there is an affinity because I understand that Her Majesty can breathe the same air with, with, with the British people. And, and she told me yesterday how many letters she's getting addressed to His Majesty. And uh, she tries to um, uh, respond to most of them. And it was very good to hear that many Ukrainians wrote words of support, of support to His Majesty um, because of his health, and she also tries to answer these letters. I also know that the royal family um, visits uh, Ukrainian centers where um, Ukrainian, uh, that Ukrainian people attend, and actually I took uh, part myself in one of these visits. I was very happy to do it. And it's very good to know that we have very sincere and powerful friends here. Uh, in, the, um, in the person of the royal family. Another of your friends is Catherine, the Princess of Wales. She's also been uh, through some health problems. She was hospitalised and is now having time out from duties. Did you have a chance to, to have a conversation with her, to call her? Um, Unfortunately, no. I think... I wasn't, I wasn't trying to do that. I, I know that the princess needs rest, and I know, know she has very active, uh, and a very active social calendar, and she needs a pause. I hope she will have time for this, and I'm not going to disturb her on this occasion, but I'm, I'm sure she knows we support her, and we wish her all the best as well. The, the late Queen Elizabeth um, was very, um, I think, very forthright in her support for Ukraine. And uh, I remember you saying that Ukrainian children would write to the Queen and she would reply, which you found extraordinary, but that was part of her magic, of course. What are your thoughts about the late Queen? I think that 
in general, this standard uh, for support of Ukraine was set by the leadership of Queen Elizabeth II. In every process of support, there needs to be a, pro a leader, a person who will set an example. And then everyone who cares will follow this example. And if there were, had not been such a leader, I guess the response from the public would not have been as powerful or would have been slower. So we are grateful. We remember those times very warmly. And for us, it's a, a very important historic figure, I think, for the whole world as well. Princess of Wales and the Prince of Wales, they went to the Ukrainian Cultural Centre in London very soon after the war started. How important was that to you? You know, uh, those were shocking days at the start of the uh, in large-scale invasion in the first weeks and months. Every sign of support was very important to us, to, for us to understand that we were not alone in this tragedy. And I don't know what would have happened if we hadn't seen signs like that, actions like that, from other societies, other countries and leaders. I think we would have been more lost and disoriented. I think people now in the world talk a lot about Ukrainian resilience and the way we were coping in the first days. But this resilience, I can say, also depended on this support from the outside. So we are very grateful for this and we don't forget this. We do not want to make similar signs, to send similar signs in, um, in response. We hope no other country will face uh, this kind of tragedy and would need that kind of support, but we would be prepared to give it in response because we are sincerely grateful. When you were at number 10 Downing Street with Akshata Murti, uh, you heard a rendition of the Ukrainian national anthem performed by the Royal Opera House Songs for Ukraine chorus. And these are Ukrainian singers who have, of course, been affected by the war. Um, you look very moved, like you were quite emotional when you heard that. Did it mean a lot to you to hear that? Uh, it was extremely nice. It was a very pleasant meeting and it was very good to see our people who um, have not only found shelter, but support also in London. And that they found an opportunity to do what they were used to doing. And they were used to singing there, they're singers. But also I was moved by the quality of the singing of our national anthem. And the second song was Prayer for Ukraine. It's very popular, uh, a very popular piece very professional and extremely well rendered. I travel a lot and I meet a lot of musical groups and sometimes I have a feeling, thank you for, I'm, I feel like, um, thank you for singing, but you could do a, a better job perhaps. <laughs> but yesterday, yesterday I really had a very pleasurable experience. I really enjoyed the way they do it, did, did, did it. It was very talented. Of course, a lot depends on the director, but they were so inspired that I was moved by their performance. And I thank uh, uh, Akshata for um, uh, organizing this meeting. More than 200,000 Ukrainians have been over in the UK staying with British families. It's a huge number of people. Are you very grateful to the, the British families who've taken in Ukrainians? Uh, I'm not just grateful. Sometimes I, I'm sincerely surprised at how noble, what a noble thing it is to do, a worthy thing to um, take someone in, in, a stranger, into your home. Especially when I speak to our refugees and they tell me their stories and how they were welcomed and how they have become friends with the British people who are looking after them. It's very good to hear. It's great. I think it's a unique story. Because it is the, it's very British, a very British thing that so many people are taking other people into their homes, into their families. Not just allow them to take a space or give them some help. 
or provide some support. No, they, they've taken these people in, into their homes. I think that's a unique British thing. How is your family? Because your, your daughter's 19 now, your son is 11. You know, these are very difficult ages for children anyway, but to have to grow up with their father running the country in a war and their mother obviously doing everything she can too. How are they, your, your children? It would not be right to complain and to say that I regret something because the situation for our family is not that different from other families in, in Ukraine. The majority of families are, um, um, are now if somebody's at the front line, somebody's abroad, many people have gone abroad. Many families have parted. And, but it, it's painful for me that they're losing these, these years of childhood. It could have been, this childhood could, could have been filled with um, memorable events, travel, studies, development, and instead, we try to maintain a, a, as normal a life as possible. Uh, our children are studying, my uh, daughter is now a second year university student, she has friends, uh, my son attends school, but of course it's difficult when you can't plan anything for your children, you can't dream together with them. Uh, over these two years we have planned a lot of things and we would have actually done, would have done these things with them so that so we could fill their lives with positive emotions. So everything is on pause, no holidays, no rest, everyone thinks about the war. My son talks constantly. Well, it's very difficult to explain this to uh, all children and to my own children. When your child asks you, when will the war be over? When will it be over? Can you tell me? There is no answer. Nobody has this answer. So it is difficult. However, we are happy that he can actually attend school and uh, we are happy that he has a shelter in his school. Which, which unfortunately is not the case for every school in Ukraine. It's a, it's a huge problem because uh, our emergency, national emergency service, does not allow for school attendance unless there is a shelter in case of an air um, alert. And m around one third of children in Ukraine study only online. For two years, for, for two years these children have not attended school uh, for even one day. They've only seen their teachers on the screen of their smartphone or their notebook. So I'm not going to complain, but of course we all want for this horrible time in our lives to be over. And um, so it would be just a period in the past and not something that would have changed our lives forever. And we all await for, we all want the spirit to be over and we want to exit it in a normal psychological and physical state, but we need efforts for that. And of course they'd had to go through a, p a pandemic before this, so they've had years and years of a hellish life really. How often can your children see your husband? Are they able to see him regularly or not? About once a week for a few hours we can meet. Sometimes less frequently or when he has um, foreign visits. And the same for you? I can see him at the presidential office sometimes because I have my own office and sometimes I can call him and if he's not too busy I can go into his office and see him. We can sometimes have lunch together but not too often. Our calendars somehow don't coincide if he has time to talk to me, I don't have time to talk to him. And yesterday, we couldn't telephone each other because he called me three times and I was in, in, in meetings. Then I start calling him and then he's busy. He can't answer. So we have sort of parallel lives, but that's normal. I spent some time this morning going through your Instagram feed because I was really curious about what you were saying at various stages. And I found one for New Year's 
Eve, actually, I think it was, in 2022, so just before the war started. And you said, in 2022, we sincerely wish near and dear ones health. To everyone, the possibilities are limitless. Self-confidence is on a daily basis. Love is in every heart. Good to all. Make it a great year. It's a very poignant message, given that within a month, your nation was at war. Um, there must be so many millions of Ukrainians whose hopes and dreams have been shattered. Very hard to deal with. Um, I mean, you managed to keep a remarkable poise and cool, which is very admirable. But do you have moments behind the scenes where sometimes you just get overwhelmed by what has happened to your country? First of all, I would like you to understand, and it is our shared feeling in Ukraine uh, of what is happening to us. You're a modern person in the 21st century. Even if there is a threat hanging over you, you still um, preserve a hope that the world cannot be so awful as to let this tragedy happen to you. The world would, uh, needs to stop the aggressor before he uh, uh, invades. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. And it, it is a tragedy to live uh, in this situation that we find ourselves in it, to see casualties every day. And you cannot switch off your emotions when you read another and another story. And recently, I was shaken by the tragedy uh, of a story of, of when the whole family was killed by a missile strike and a, a mother was killed together with her two sons. One of them was younger than one year old. They burnt alive. These things don't allow you to be um, happy or, um, or calm ever. There's no opportunity for that. And there are some things that just finish you off. This is the, the essence of these horrible things when you just start crying and sobbing. Uh, recently, there was a documentary made by one of our directors, and I wasn't able to watch it to the end. It was, uh, it consists fully of things that were filmed by people um, on their telephones uh, at the start of the invasion. Uh, director is uh, uh, Badoyev, and uh, it's called A Long Day. I did not, I could not stand it for a very long time. Uh, I was in tears. Um, I felt all of the emotions. It was really powerful. I will, I will finish watching uh, this film to the end, but I just didn't have enough em emotional uh, reserves to, to finish it. At the first time, I couldn't. There's another documentary, 20 Days in Mariupol, I mm. think it's quite well known. Right. My daughter went to see it with her friend. Uh, in a cinema at the premiere, and her boyfriend is from Mariupol, and he and his uh, parents had an opportunity to, to hide in the basement of their building for several weeks before they were able to flee. And he saw with his own eyes the bodies of his neighbors that uh, had been killed. And uh, yeah, I asked her, how did you take it? And she said, I cried. He cried also. But also the, the rest of the people in the uh, cinema cried. So on the one hand, it's very difficult. But on the other hand, sometimes you need to let it out. You need to cry. All of the emotions that we accumulate every day. So I'm very grateful to the people who made these documentaries. Because first of all, they tell the world about us. And for us, it's a way of therapy, a way to let it go. To, and we cannot do it all the time. My job 
is to keep smiling, to keep talking to people, to inspire people. Um, do I have the, uh, it, regardless of whether or not I have the energy for that. So I try to keep my emotions inside. And these things are a way for me to let go for at least a few minutes. Your husband, Vladimir Sedabachi, he told Vogue magazine, she is my love, she is my greatest friend. Elena really is my best friend. She's also a patriot and she deeply loves Ukraine and she's an excellent mother. That's a pretty good tribute. <laughs> I can only say thank you for the word. Um, it's perhaps not the first time I hear this. I'm fortunate he tells me this uh, very often. But we are really friends. We are friends and that, I think that's the secret of our relationship. We don't have a difficult time with, with each other. We understand each other and we support each other. It's not just the uh, words, well done, keep working, I believe in, in, in you. No, we can uh, make each other laugh when it's uh, needed, or perhaps... Or we can tell each other, uh, get a grip, go get your job done. So we can we feel each other, but it's, it's very nice for me that he's so open with his feel, feelings in talking to the media. However, I don't need to hear it, and I know this. And you said about him in an Instagram post on his birthday, January 25th, 2022, again, just before the war began. And you posted a picture of him smiling at you at a party. Mm -hmm. And you captioned it, I'm sure you're looking at me in this picture, because that's how you always look at me. I wish every woman had these views. So look only those who sincerely love. I always feel your love. As long as you look like that, I'm not afraid of anything. Have a look, please take a look. We still have a lot to go, so take care of yourself. We have to realize everything we dream of together. Happy birthday to my love. I promise to look back at you just like that all the time. Again, very poignant, given that within a month, your whole lives were turned upside down. Um, there is also that I received the most difficult for us. I guess the most difficult time for us when we were separated. He stayed in Kyiv and I had to go outside of Kyiv and spend several weeks outside of Kyiv. And this is when I had the most horrible thoughts come to my head. And I was thinking that perhaps we will never see each other again. And what allowed me to hold on is that we still have a lot to do together, that I want to do together. And, and we still have to, absolutely have to meet. And uh, that was a very sincere uh, post. I, it was a greeting for him. This year I didn't have a, I didn't post on his birthday because on that day very tragic things had happened. And uh, we agreed that I'm not going to wish him happy birthday publicly. It wasn't the right time to talk about happy things. I, I suggested we stay silent on that day, and he understood that. But I guess every, with every year, it's more and more difficult to come up with new things for me to say to him. Uh, we have been together for so many years, and, and sometimes we can just be silent, be quiet with each other. If you can stay quiet with each other, uh, each other long enough, I think, I guess, uh, that's what we dream about. Um, enough time to stay together, enough time not to rush anywhere, not to plan anything, not to worry about anything. It's a dream right now. Not something extraordinary, just a quiet time together. Do you worry about him and his mental health? He seems, in public, such a strong mentality man. Mm -hmm. He never stops. He flies around the world. He does everything he can for his country. But you see him behind the scenes. Does he have moments where even he, Vladimir Zelensky, needs you to keep him going? Fortunately, he's not that different 
the way he is in public and privately. I, I think he is really somebody you can count on when you need to, to charge from his energy. He is holding on well. But it's not because, well, I think it's his nature, his natural capacity. I work a lot with the subject of mental health, and I understand that mental, psychological resilience is different in different people. There's a, just like a general health, just like immunity, there are some natural um, capacity that uh, people have, that they can uh, withstand without any damage to their mental health. Of course, he, uh, it's a diff very difficult time for him, he gets very tired, but he has his own ways to recharge. Children always help. He can have a silly time with, with them, to sing silly songs, uh, laugh with them, and that that also helps him to recharge. He does uh, sport, and that's a huge help for him when he is uh, so tense, when uh, the, your nerves are so tense that they're just about to give out. He will uh, go and, and do um, a training session, and, and he feels better. He knows what to do. Uh, it's just that uh, there's not enough time to sleep sometimes. But that's also not something that can be resolved now. I'm, uh, I am sure he will withstand everything. He has the capacity. He's strong. As often happens in war, the leader has come under more and more criticism. His popularity numbers have fallen. People, when they're feeling fearful, when you know, their worlds are collapsing, they want someone to blame and many have started blaming uh, Vladimir. He's been accused of corruption, of being an autocrat. Uh, the mayor of Kyiv, Vitaly Klitschko, says people are beginning to see who's effective and who's not. Zelensky is paying for mistakes he's made. At some point, we will no longer be any different from Russia, where everything depends on the whim of one man. What's your response to that? Uh, I would very much like for the person who is responsible for everything would be somebody else, not my husband whom I love and respect. But he is responsible for everything. And he is being responsible. He carries the responsibility. He knows it and he is very responsible um, with his job. Political struggle never stops, not even during the war. That's how the world is, and I'm fine um, about this criticism. Nobody's ever happy with everything, especially in a difficult time like this. Of course, it is difficult for the people to um, carry this load of war. Sometimes people see bad things happening and they're looking for someone to blame. And I guess the easiest person to blame is the person who's responsible for everything. So I'm fine with this criticism. I, what I don't accept is um, total hatred, which is not based uh, in facts, which also happens sometimes. And I know that the aggressor will always stoke any kind of tension inside the country that would undermine our uh, unity. Um, and a lot of resources uh, is spent on this. They use every opportunity, any message, any trend in the Ukrainian society to, to stoke uh, the negative things. And uh, I understand the rules and I'm fine with this. He will uh, take any criticism. For me, perhaps it's more difficult emotionally because I take offense sometimes, I, I get upset. Um, and he, I think, 
he, um, he is very professional about it. What is the most hurtful thing that people have said about your husband that really upsets you? I guess I wouldn't rate these things. All of these things are hurtful. When uh, it's being said about a person you love and respect, it's, it's never nice. But I don't think there's ever been anything that really shook me. Um, I think what's perceived the worst is something that looks like the truth. About him, what's said is really fantastical things that don't look like the truth at all, so I'm fine. Let me talk about uh, Russia and Putin and his state of the, uh, of the uh, nation address. He threatened the West again with nuclear weapons if they put boots on the ground in Ukraine. He said to Tucker Carlson in his interview that he hasn't achieved his goals yet. What's your message to, to Putin? He clearly thinks he's going to beat you and win. To be honest, I wouldn't even want to say this name. To be honest, I'm not a part of this dialogue. You know, previously, I don't know how it was in Britain before, but when we were children in the Soviet Union, sometimes uh, children would write letters and uh, put them in a time capsule or, or send them to space. And then maybe somebody, sometime an alien will find this uh, capsule and will read this message from these uh, Soviet children from the 1970s. It's the same thing. Why would I write this message to nowhere? Nobody will hear it. Nobody will pay any attention. It's just a gesture addressed to. Some people think Ukraine should do a peace deal, should give up the land that Russia has taken. What do you feel about that? I think that President Zelensky gave a very, very clear answer at his level. And it's not just his opinion as the leader and the president of, the, of our country. It's a, an opinion. It's an opinion that he um, expresses on behalf of our nation. We are not prepared to, to make allowances. We don't want to, this war to last for decades. We understand that the aggressor does not stop when he receives what he wants. He will continue moving farther and farther. We don't want our children to, to still be uh, uh, fighting in this war and then our uh, grandchildren. We want to stop this now. Uh, we, can, we will not stop this on their term, terms. America at the moment is obviously crucial to Ukraine's defense and they're still holding up on the $60 billion. It's still held up in Congress. Mm -hmm. What's your message to the politicians in America about how vital that money is for you and why they should see it in America's national interest? While decisions are being taken, People are dying, and that's the worst thing that can happen. I want them to feel that every hour that they hesitate, that they go to their offices, that they meet with their colleagues. In Ukraine, people are dying, and they do not have to be dying, and that's the worst thing that is happening. And I'm sure that the majority of people there wants to help Ukraine. And we understand that their internal political processes in the United States and we know they're complex they're not simple and we are awaiting this decision but we really really need it I'll give you an example just for the civilian population air defense saves lives everywhere in Ukraine Russia can reach with their missiles and their drones, they can reach any part of Ukraine and they're 
constantly doing this. They want us to live in fear. And yes, we know when we hear the siren of uh, uh, air raid, we go down to uh, shelters. But not every place in Ukraine has shelters. And still, children in schools are dying. Children in their homes are dying while, while sleeping. And if we had enough air defense, we'd feel more resilient. This is a matter of life and death. And I would really like for those decision makers to understand it very profoundly. It's not about money, it's not about political point scoring, it's about life. Is President Biden doing enough, do you think, to get this money to you? This is a very political question. I cannot answer, I, can give you a, I cannot give you a clear answer. I think that he's trying to do what he can. But I think it's a question for the politicians. Donald Trump, who may be president again, he says he could end this war in 24 hours. When you hear that, what do you think? I don't think that anyone can uh, end this war in 24 hours, except Putin. What's your message to Putin? I mean, if he watches this interview, he might. What, what's your message to him? As a, as a Ukrainian, as a mother, as a wife, what do you say to this guy? I just don't know what this is for. I could never understand this. I do not understand any of the answers that he gives. It's, I, I do not understand it. And I don't know how a normal person can live with this. There have been hundreds of cases of Ukrainian women who've been raped and abused by Russian soldiers. Over 20,000 Ukrainian children have been effectively kidnapped and taken out of the country. There have been barbaric attacks on maternity units and whole cities raised to the ground and so on. Uh, I went to Bucha myself when I was over in, in Ukraine. Devastating to hear the stories of what happened there. These are all war crimes. Should Putin be in an international court facing war crime charges? Behind every crime, there is that person who carried out the crime and the person who commissioned the crime. And we don't know every person that carried out the crime, but we definitely know who commissioned the crime, who ordered the crime. And there needs to be punishment for every crime. The, uh, David Cameron, the Foreign Secretary here, who you met, he would like to see, as would Rishi Sunak, the transfer of Russian assets for the recovery mm -hmm. of Ukraine. And I think you feel strongly that that would be a good thing. I think this is fair. Russia has to pay financially for the damage done to Ukraine, for the destruction uh, of our infrastructure, for everything that had been built for decades. And we understand that uh, we may never see any financial compensation directly. So it would be fair for these financial assets that Russia has in our partner countries to be frozen and to be uh, uh, spent on the renewal of our infrastructure. Why should our partners uh, help us to rebuild? Why shouldn't it be the people who destroyed it? One of the big problems that Ukraine has at the moment is there's another war raging in the Middle East, Israel and Hamas in Gaza, and it's taken a lot of media attention away from Ukraine. It's led to a kind of war fatigue people call it about Ukraine. How important is it that people who watch this interview understand that your war is still raging, unfinished, and it needs our attention? 
Вы правильно сказали? Quite right in saying uh, a second war has started while the first one is still going on. We need to understand that more wars can start in other places, but it doesn't mean that the war in Ukraine will stop. And this fatigue from the war, well, of course, it's hurtful to hear for us. Ukrainians are much more fatigued. Ukrainians are tired, but we have to hold on because this is a matter of our survival. If you're tired from the news, switch them off. Don't get tired. You are tired. Um, if you're tired, you're not our allies. We do not allow you uh, to get tired. We cannot say, don't look at us, don't look at our suffering. If you are tired, you are not our friends. It's sad, but that's life. And we are going to continue fighting for our lives, for the lives of our children, and we will not get tired doing this. I know that after October the 7th, the, the devastating terror attack in Israel, you spoke to President Herzog's wife. Obviously, since then, Israel has responded with great force and there is growing concern around the world about the number of civilian casualties, particularly children. As a mother, how do you feel about what's happening in Gaza? For me, civilian casualties are the worst from either side. And I cannot judge the actions of either side but when you see a killed child of any nationality, it's uh, horrible, it's very painful. As a mother, I feel that we adults are to blame. And we owe these children. We, uh, we owe them a life, we owe them a childhood. We adults collectively cannot make sure that these children can be safe. First lady, we should all feel ashamed. First Lady, thank you very much indeed for your time. I hope this war ends for you and your people, and I hope it ends soon. And all our thoughts here in, in Britain are with you and with your family and with your people. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much.